Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the audit committee of the 8th of December. Um, before I start the agenda, can I just make a warm welcome to uh, Andrew Stevens for his first meeting and also to Julie Davis, the new lay member, to her first meeting. Welcome both and I hope you get into the swing of the meeting uh, very quickly and I'm sure you'll be really valuable participants to the discussion that we'll have today. Um, so if I can take apologies for absence first, please. Uh, Councillor David Helliwell and Jason Garcia. Thank you very much. Could I have any disclosures of personal or prejudicial interest, please? Yes, I'm uh, item four. I, I'm a governor of Pantra Harvard School. Thank you, Councillor Black. No others? OK, if we can move on to the minutes of the 10th of November. Uh, only a short set of minutes, but a very valuable um, meeting with the of the risk management arrangements. So again, I'd like to thank everyone for their participation in that. So if we can take the minutes for accuracy first, page one, page two, page three. Can I ask for a show of hands for accuracy and acceptance of those meetings, please? Sure. Thank you. Like yeah, things. Councillor White. I also declared interest as Governor Pent for Harvard in item four. OK, thank you. Councillor Paxton Hood Williams, do you have your hand up? Uh, sorry, Madam Chair, it was only in terms of voting really as much as anything else. OK, thank you very so much. I'm showing my support. Thank you very much indeed. OK. Um, if we can move on then to um, the internal audit progress report. Um, this is to note for information and thank you, Simon, before you commence to position the report for this is an additional report that we ask for just to keep sighted of the pressures on the internal audit team and the service they provide to the council during this awful pandemic period of time. So over to you, please, Simon. Great, thank you, Chair. Yeah, as you've explained, obviously this is a slightly shorter report than a normal quarterly report the committee receives. Um, they'll receive the quarterly report in February in due course with more detail. This is just um, a, a one-off update as requested in the previous meeting, as the chair has explained. And basically it details the work that the team has done to the year to date, up to the 23rd of November. Um, obviously the team continue to work from home and uh, continue to do as much work remotely as they can possibly do. But um, we are still restricted in terms of being able to do any site visits for our own safety and for the community. Um, we have managed to progress fairly well up to date. Obviously, there have been some difficulties and the team is continuing to do all they can to, to do as much as they can remotely. Um, so if we go to section two of the report, I'll just quickly make the, the, the key points of the, of the, of the report. 2.1. To the 23rd of November, um, 44 orders have been finalised up to final report stage, as shown in Appendix 1. Of those reports, 28 were given a high assurance, 15 had a substantial assurance, and one was given a moderate level of assurance. That was the accounts receivable report, which members are already aware of. Um, over that period, 235 recommendations had been made, and 100% of those have been accepted by client departments. Um, the team has also been involved with the um, COVID-19 support work that the authority has been um, implementing for, in terms of the grant payments. And to date, up to the 23rd of November, and the team has spent about 46 days on that support, which is just verification checks prior to payment to pick up on any errors or anomalies in the payment um, data. Um, so yeah, as, as shown in Appendix 2, um, you can see that as of the 23rd of November, 36 audits from the 2021 plan had been completed to at least draft report stage, which is approximately 23% of the whole plan. An additional 37 audits were in progress, which again represents another 23% of the plan. Um, so overall, about 46% of the plan was either complete or in progress as of the 23rd of November, which given that the difficulties the team has experienced, I think is a fairly good figure, not what we would expect the some of you normally, but obviously we are in unprecedented times and I think that's a fairly reasonable figure to have expected from the team to date. Um, as I've mentioned previously, the team have been allocated an additional number of jobs this year to be more flexible 
Um, and so an additional 35 orders have been allocated for them to try and progress, which represents another 22 percent of the of the actual plan. Um, obviously, that you know that the pandemic is going to have a detrimental effect on our ability to deliver the entire plan. Um, but to date, we have we are making good progress. Uh, but and unfortunately, there will be a drop in in output come the end of the year. As I've explained to members previously, we have concentrated on um, the fundamental systems because obviously they are core to the, the authorities and to the assurance levels. Um, as shown in Appendix 2 and as noted in 2.10, three of the seven fundamental audits that are due this year have been completed already by the 23rd of November and additional two reviews were underway as of that date. Um, so I'm fairly confident that, you know, come the end of the year, all of the fundamental reports, uh, fundamental orders will be completed, um, which is obviously one of the key, um, key underpinning areas for our assurance statement coming the year end. Um, so yeah, I mean, as, as shown in Appendix 2, the jobs that we finalised to date are listed in more detail, some of which have come forward from previous year. And uh, then the, the actual plan and the, the progress against the plan is shown in Appendix 2. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is just a, another update for a committee to keep track of where we're at, uh, for me to highlight any issues we've had to date. Um, nothing's really changed since the last full quarterly report in terms of the, you know, the struggles we are facing. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to take any questions if, if any members have any queries. OK, thank you very much, Simon. Um, before I, I've got a couple of queries. Uh, but before I, I raise mine, any questions from members, please? If you can raise your hand. Julie, put a hand up. Julie, can I invite yeah. you to? Oh, thank you. Um, just one for clarification. Quarter three, <clears throat> Appendix one states that the fundamental system, uh, fundamental audit of council tax is finalised, but it doesn't specify which year that relates to. So can you confirm it's 2021? Or is it yes. 1920? Yes, yeah, sorry, Julie, it's this current year. It's the 2021 financial year. OK, thank you. And I've got um, one one other comment on the on Appendix 1, although it's, it's a very succinct report, and I, I thank you for that. Because we don't know the materiality of the recommendations, um, we can't put the assurance rating into context. So I don't know whether it would be possible or feasible for you to put the high, at least the high recommendations in as a specific number for, you know, to put the assurance rating in context? Or is that going to a, a greater level of detail than you would want? Um, what I can suggest, Julie, if we could maybe wait until the quarterly report is seen in February, because they do have a lot more detail and context of some of the, either the substantial or the moderate reports. So yeah. this is this is meant as a snapshot, really, as just at one point in time. But the, if you if you were to look at the previous quarterly reports, which I'm happy mm -hmm. to send on to you directly to have a look through, maybe we could discuss that outside of the meeting because there there is more detail in those reports to give you more sort of idea of what we covered as part of the review, and a summary of the scope and a summary of the key areas that we we picked up on. So I think that is is probably partly covered by the the quarterly reports, if that's okay. Okay, that's great. Thanks. If, if I could just add to that, to uh, just give you assurance, Julie, um, mm -hmm. the internal audit progress report has been um, developing and improving every every few months, really, um, to pick up the very thing you raised, because I was struggling to get how much assurance I was gaining with the breadth and depth of the audit coverage and the significance of the um, the moderate ratings mm -hmm. in the context of not just recommendations made, but where there were shortcomings in the, the internal control arrangements. So Simon's kindly enhanced that information. I think we could still always improve on it, but we're in a much better place now to get a feel of what's happening. And I also ask for a copy of every audit report in full um, so I can review the details you know, outside of the meeting. I think it would be too onerous for every member to have those reports at every meeting because the meetings would extend on for hours and hours. But um, perhaps you and I can have a conversation outside as, as the new lem lay member coming in. Uh, okay. But Simon's been very, very accommodating in, in improving what's happening. Uh, Leslie, I can see your hand up. Councillor Walton. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to say um, thank you to Simon and his team for managing to get 
so far as he's done at this point, bearing in mind how horrendously disruptive the COVID pandemic has been. And I think <clears throat> all credit to all of you that you're still more or less on the ball. You're not really ridiculously behind. So just a big thank you to all of you for all your hard work. Thanks very much, Leslie. I'll be sure to feed that back to the team. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor. No, I certainly concur with that. It's it's quite uh, quite an achievement to to get to the position that that the team are in in the circumstances that they're working under. Um, uh, Councillor Paxton Hood Williams. Um, I was just going to agree basically with what uh, <coughs> Councillor Walton has said, Chairman. Of course, I was saying, I guess. The question in, in that respect, as far as Simon is concerned, um, obviously it's been a extremely difficult year. You've had to concentrate on doing work that you can do basically desk bound. Um, and presumably you're starting to do some of that work for next year. Would it be fairer for us if we were to look at the overall results over two years rather than one year before we decide exactly where we are in terms of whether you've been successful or not in completing the programme? Because I think what you've done so far has been tremendous, and that's been already said. But I think a two-year picture will give us a better picture at the end of the day. I don't know if you agree, Madam Chairman. I wouldn't disagree with that, um, if I'm honest. And we may be in that position because one of the comments uh, I was going to make was we, we need to keep a watch on how much work has been done and completed and the level of assurance when we come to prepare the governance statement or the council prepares the governance statement because we may need to put some caveats in that as to what we are gaining and gleaning assurance from. And that may be the audits that were um, running in from last year into this year, and maybe what started in, in the current year and looking into next. So I think it's a conversation that we will need to raise again, Councillor Paxton Hood-Williams, um, but it's a very valid point. I think we may be in that position, and I don't think we'll be alone. I think other local authorities and, and health organisations will be exactly the same. Um, but yes, it's commendable what you've done to date, um, Simon, I have to say, because it's very difficult. Um, and particularly audited on a desktop basis yeah. is not perfect. I think that itself will have some limitations, as Julie will appreciate, you know, with the background in internal audit as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of discussion we need to have at a future point in time on how much assurance we gain from the internal audit plan. Having said that, that's the, not the only source of assurance that the local authority will have because there's assurance coming from the scrutiny work that's been done from the governance work stream and kindly Councillor Walton has been sitting on that work stream for the governance statement to ensure that that's got rigour and you know there's some scrutiny applied to that one statement as well. So um, the only other thing I'd want to say is recognising you're working on some grant work and verification checks. Can you confirm that's not compromising any audit independence? And the second one is uh, you mentioned at paragraph 2.9, you may have to assist in reactive work. Do you know what that reactive work would be and what impact it'll have on your resource, please? Oh, thanks, Chair. I, mean, I just want to pick up some of the points from Paxton. I think obviously this day is very much a blip in, in, the, in, the, in the normal running of the audit department. So I think the two yearly cycle and review would be beneficial because comparing this to next year, this is bound to have an impact next year as well um, after March. So I think taking a longer view of things would be beneficial for, you know, for to, to judge performance. Um, just to pick up on the, the queries for the grants, um, Chair, We've only been involved with those after they've been processed and assessed. So the checks that we're undertaking here are only when it's got to um, prepayment um, prepayment stage. So we are basically just checking the details of the amount is correct and the bank payment details are correct, just to pick up on any obvious errors. So we aren't involved in the in the grant approval process in any way. It's just purely a tick box check to make sure we can pick up on anything that's untoward or incorrect, essentially. So we have no say in the grant uh, in a grant approval process. So I think I'm fairly safe. We are independent in that respect. Thank you. And then the two point and the last question. Yeah, so the two point nine reactive stuff. 
And we've put that in there purely as a caveat, really, should anything else arise between now and the end of March that we might need to get involved with. Um, who we see in grant schemes coming in on a weekly, fortnightly basis. We just want to be um, add value and be reactive, really, like the whole authority is being to support whatever has been introduced. So I can't pinpoint what exactly that is, um, but I mean we're just trying to be as, as valuable to the authority as possible in reacting the same way as the you know the finance directors and heads of service are being reactive to the different schemes that are being put in place. Okay, that's fine. If if you can just be minded of the independence that you you know so you don't compromise that in any shape or form and if there's any risk of that if you could give me the heads up please yeah absolutely um, ben thank you chair two things for me yes just to assure you in terms of the independence of functions simon and i are holding the line entirely that it is only normal audit practice in terms of checking systems at the end the bit i really wanted to come in chair and it's to give advice to the committee is that obviously forming your overall view because you've recognized there's a whole raft of things that Simon's team have not been able to work on. Just in terms of value, I remind you that the rapidly devised grant schemes to date are over 100 million quid. We're working on another one at the moment. So in terms of scale, as I've advised both Cabinet and Council, you're talking about a budget flexed by a quarter of its entire net budget. I know I'm slightly comparing apples and pears there in terms of gross and net budget, but we started with a 450 million pound budget and we'll have worked our way through probably by year and another 125, 130 million by the time new schemes come in. And you should be able to take some significant assurance that resources have been diverted at the desktop on certainly large value items. So it's a perfectly logical response to the sort of audit universe that Simon is facing as the principal audit executive. Um, and also one that we would want to divert some resources to anyway, because these were rapidly designed and are new, both ripe candidates for error, fraud, omission, et cetera. So I remain relaxed in terms of the advice I give you overall that it's logical and proportionate. And as Simon indicated earlier in his report, we are focusing especially on the fundamentals, because they're non-negotiable in terms of that overall level of assurance. But I can assure you, Chair, we are maintaining the independence of audit in the role and ultimately to satisfy Welsh Government, because we're really only acting as agent of Welsh Government on all of these large scale grants. Um, the bits that are done by the bid process to get money back for our own costs incurred is slightly different, but all of the business grants and reliefs um, and we've confirmed that with Audit Wales, they're effectively treating us as agent of Welsh Government as their delivery partner. Thank you very much. Councillor Jeff Jones, do you have your hand up? Yes, I do actually. Um, we're actually talking about fundamentals here, you know, the, shall we say, the most important parts. And I appreciate, you know, the uh, additional work the audit uh, team has actually taken on. But Simon, when you're actually auditing, um, shall we say, other departments and so on, other departments have been affected by COVID. A lot of the staff have been seconded. What sort of um, le do you do you actually introduce any leeway when you actually carry audits because of the COVID? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And what we've tended to find those departments that have been severely affected by um, staff relocation or closure. We have had, had difficulty actually progressing them. So the majority that we've done tend to have been the ones that have been impacted, but have then returned to some sort of normality with, with a new sort of operating of working. So where, you know, departments say like the, you know, for example, the Grand Theatre had to close down, essentially, we could not physically do that review. But others have been affected, but maybe not so much, or they've had key staff in post to keep the departments running who have had time to help us. So there is obviously some leeway. There might be some odd tests that we aren't able to cover. So, for example, if it's if it's not really a material test, you know, if it's a small petty cash test that's normally included as part of the review, we would put a caveat in the report to say because of the circumstances, we aren't able to cover that bit of the testing. So it's, it's stipulated in the report and then it's considered as part of the overall risk of the whole audit, whether we can carry out that audit without doing that test. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very much ad hoc and case by case basis, really, Jeff. Um, I mean, some have been severely uh, affected, some haven't. And those that haven't have been um, able to help us to progress with the reviews. But again, some, some of the scope of the reviews have been slightly only if it's not material to the testing. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions, please, before I close this item? No more hands. I've missed anyone. 
Okay, I say this this is for information and noting. So can I thank you again, Simon, for everything? Jeff, did you want to come in again? I, your hand is up. No. no? Okay. Sorry. Can Jeff. I just say can I just can say, I just say one last thing, Chair? Sorry. Um just to give members some some idea of um year end processes. We have had some updated guidance issued to the local authorities recently from SIPFA. Um, obviously we aren't unique in the in the fact that we're affected by this and the coverage that we can provide at year end for assurance. So SIPFA have provided us with some draft guidance of what we can consider for the annual governance statement. So just to just to keep members up to date, obviously, you know, we will take that on board come year end. And, you know, the AGS might be slightly different this year and my opinion might be slightly different this year. But again, that is um, consistent across all authorities. Thank you, Simon. Could you send me a copy of that and also a copy to Councillor Leslie Walton, please? Yeah, no problem. So we can be uh, reminded of what that is. Yeah. So can I just close this? And, uh, thank you again, Simon. If you can give our thanks to the team as well um, and continue with what you can do and well done. Um, if we can move on to the next agenda item, which is the annual governance statement update. Is this Adam? Thank you, Chair. Yes, if uh, if, if I may, I'll, I'll take this one. I'll, I'll try and keep it relatively brief because I think all the information's in there. This this report represents that the update that we said that we would bring on the action plan. Um, I think it's fair to say, as, as Simon's already highlighted, that um, although a lot of work has been undertaken on this, it has been affected during this year because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, it will not only have a considerable effect on this year, but also into next year. It, it's not likely to end anytime soon, although there is hope of vaccines and so on. The reality is that it will continue to affect what we can do and what we can deliver in terms of both action plan and, and the ways in which we can offer assurance. That's not to say we won't offer assurance, but we need to look at things differently in the in the current climate that we're in. So if I just take it through the, the pages, um, page 17 sets out really the, the background to, to where the annual governance statement came from. This is for 1920. Um, so it was at the end of that, that 1920, and my thanks to, to Leslie um, for her work on, on the uh, annual governance board uh, and actually for her help in shaping the, the statement because uh, it was really nice to have uh, a member on here from the audit committee to, to help us and also be that critical friend which is very important to us in terms of getting this right. So, so my thanks to, to Leslie uh, for her assistance. If we then move on to page 18 and page 19, there are the eight points that were identified there in terms of um, what, what we classed as significant um, either governance issues or risks. Um, I think there would be some question of how significant perhaps some of those are. Um, and I think things that we, you know, it's a learning process. And I think, um, you know, take the social media one, for example, I think looking forwards, whether that truly is a significant risk or issue or more operational. Uh, I think it's something we need to uh, finesse as we as we get into the end of this year and, and looking at future action plans. Um, within pages 18 and 19, it gives a summary um, of each of the actions and the work that has been undertaken. If I then go on to Appendix A, which you can find at page 20, um, this goes down into more detail. It shows what the significant governance issue was in, the, in a little more detail. The action plan that was put in place and where we are in terms of the update. And again, I'd like to extend my thanks to the staff because a lot of work has been undertaken and although may not have progressed as far as we would have been in a normal year, actually what I hope you can see is that and have some assurance from is that work has continued even while most of, of the staff diverted into frontline or support service during during the pandemic. The only final point I'd like to draw your attention to is on page 26 in the final comment is that there have been lots of areas impacted by COVID um, pandemic, um, which has resulted in delays. You know, Simon was talking about some in terms of the audit work that's been undertaken, but that's the same across the whole of the council. 
Um, and what I would suggest is uh, whether it be I've, I've put in the report January, um, it may be later into to February, depending, because um, I think as Paxton said earlier, that the numbers have escalated beyond belief in terms of COVID and we're back into a full response mode in terms of the council in order to be able to to cope with those numbers. Um, and we are pretty much now a Swansea Bay region, obviously one of the highest regions now across Wales. So that is now diverting us again. But as soon as I can, um, we'll get a report back to the committee um, showing exactly what other impacts COVID has had, just to give you the assurance of, although it's had an impact, what would we do to mitigate and, and make sure we still have assurance for how, um, how we're going to do the annual governance statement at the end of the year. Um, I'll leave it there, Chair, and, and really let, open it up for, for questions. I think the report is self-explanatory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Before I open up for questions, can I invite Councillor Walton to comment, as Councillor Walton has sat on these meetings on a regular basis as the audit member? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't really uh, think there's much that I can really add to what Adam has said. I think um, I have been able to contribute which uh, and represent the committee, but I think my comments have been raised and covered at previous meetings. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. OK, thank you. And thank you on behalf of members of the audit committee for undertaking that work. It is appreciated. I've got four hands up, uh, Councillor um, Peter Black, Councillor pa Paxson Hood Williams, Councillor Peter Jones, and Councillor Mike White. So if I start with Councillor Black, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I've got three questions on Appendix A, if that's okay. Um, okay. The first one in relates to performance reviews. Um, these have to be, if you're gonna get this right, these have to be done in this systemic way. And obviously, I fully understand that we're under huge amounts of pressure at the moment that staff have been diverted elsewhere and that isn't possible to put that into place properly at this stage. But of course, we're also in a situation whereby this could go on for some time, even with the, the vaccine being rolled out, it's going to take at least a year to roll that out properly. So clearly, we're going to have to adjust as a council to how we work um, in relation to the situation we find ourselves in. And I think performance reviews are, are going to be absolutely crucial in terms of, make, of raising the general level performance of the council. So I'm just interested um, if there is a uh, plan as to how we can get these introduced in a, in, a, in a more systemic way, or are we already halfway there? Just a bit more of update on that particular item. The next one um, on the Future Generation Act, um, I, I, I very much welcome the um impact the um the the tool that's been at gen, um uh, this the impact assessment tool that's been developed uh, I, I wonder whether we could have a demonstration of that so that we can understand how that's going to work i think that would be quite useful and then my final query is on the social media i note what adam said social media though has the potential to be a huge reputational risk to this authority and I'm not comfortable about taking it out of a out of the governance side of things. I'm not quite clear on the reasoning behind that, but certainly I do think that we do have to keep on top of that. And and it seems to me that this given that governance and communication go hand in hand. So I do think that that maybe need to reconsider that. Thank you, Adam. Would you like to respond to those three questions? Yeah. No problem at all. Um, performance reviews, what we've done is is rather than do the appraisal system, which is, as you'll you'll probably be aware, is is quite cumbersome. We, we've streamlined the appraisal system anyway, and, and we're about to relaunch a new appraisal system. Unfortunately, with, with, with COVID and the pandemic, that, yeah. that's not enabled us to do it. So what we've done is made sure that we're still managing performance, but we're doing it through a one to one basis, which is already happening. So rather than duplicating and doing, we do a, a either a, a fortnightly or monthly one-to-one -one anyway with all staff as, as we go through. Um, the performance element will be is brought into that one-to-one -one basis, so it's still documented and recorded in in that way, so that people have an audit trail of any corrective action or uh, what people are working to, what performance measures are expected. It's just done on a, that local level rather than 
the appraisal system goes back directly to the corporate plan. It goes back to the service plans. Because of what we're in now, we are focusing on what that person is doing in order to either support the council generically or whether they're supporting the COVID response. So, so it's still being picked up, still managing performance and still being recorded. We're just not doing the appraisal for the current current year. Um, we will review it again uh, come the end of the financial year to see where we are with regard to the COVID response and hopefully bring something else in at that point if it's right to do so. If not, we will continue this while we are still in response mode and then bring back the appraisals with the, the more streamlined version into the, into the future, which will hopefully not too distant future. Uh, happy to do a demonstration on the, on the Future Generations Act. It, it's more of a, um, we do the equality impact assessments at the moment that you, you'll be aware of for all reports that come through. It's working on a similar basis to that in terms of it's a report structure that doesn't mean that the Future Generations is just a, have you considered it? Yes, tick. It actually asks you to define that area and what is it that you've done to consider it from the inception of the idea rather than what we have been doing is at the end when we're doing a report to um, to almost get approval. It's actually building in from the very start. So um, ha happy to either circulate or um, we can present that to a future um, audit committee just to talk you through how that's gone. Probably best at the end of the pilot and sort of give you that feedback and that assurance of, of how it's gone. Um, the social media was really around um, at, at the time looking at how many social media accounts that we'd got and whether or not it was uh, how we were responding to the Welsh version of social media accounts as well as the English version to make sure that that was picked up. Now that's really picked up under the Future Generations Act, under the Welsh language standards. So it's more around, actually, is it social media that's the issue or is it actually that we're meeting the future generations? And I think, um, you know, cards on the table, I think it was a, a learning process that said perhaps we haven't defined it quite sufficiently. Not that social media isn't a risk or, or an issue, it's that I'm not sure we defined it perhaps as well as we could have done in order to get a meaningful um, performance based outcome. You know, to, for it to be smart in terms of the action plan, that 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 was my meaning, not not necessarily that we'd do away with it. Can I, I, just, ask, can I just ask a follow up on that last point? Um, do we take account of our communication strategy as part of the governance review? Yes, so the, the the communications comes right through that, and that obviously sits within my team and within yeah. our, um, we, we have our SMAS, a senior management assurance statements, of which the head of comms has his aspect within that also, and then that's shared across uh, all the services. So so yes, that is taken taken into account. Our social media would be formed part of that, presumably? It would. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If we can move on then to Councillor Hood-Williams. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Very simple question this time on page 24, the ICT disaster recovery plan. I'm not quite sure exactly where we are with that at the moment, Adam. Um, I really am asking the question is that if we were to have a full operational system uh, breakdown completely, would we still have a full recovery potential or is it still partial at this point in time? Thank you, Chair, if I may. Um, yeah, we do have a, d a disaster recovery plan already in place and, and what we're trying to do is make it more resilient. So at the moment we, we have uh, a server room, if you like, and, and that's got some of our data stored. There is a transition over to cloud for some of the areas. Um, the Oracle Cloud that we've mentioned at, at previous committees, which is our uh, moving from our Oracle, which is our HR finance support system is being transferred over to the cloud. Obviously, that had to go on to hold um, while the COVID pandemic uh, is upon us. And so that, that's been delayed by one year. So um, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't recover. It's just making it more resilient than the recovery plan that we've got in currently. So we, we do have a, a disaster recovery plan. It is in place for all the systems. We just want it to be smarter and better in terms of uh, security. Okay, thank okay. you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Adam. Councillor Peter Jones, thank you for your patience. No, not at all. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I 
the reference to the future well-being of future generations act and the steps that are being taken in relation to that in terms of training awareness raising understanding and so forth um, but i'd also like to reference the welsh government environment act in 2016 legislation for maintaining and enhancing biodiversity and also setting out uh, climate change uh, strategy targets uh, etc um, one of the recommendations of the natural environment scrutiny inquiry exercise that i chaired a couple of years ago now was for appropriate staff and member training in relation to the environment act because the environment act has implications right across the board in terms of what the council is responsible its various functions and so forth so i'm just wondering um should the Enqui environment act not be included in the governance exercise to ensure that all staff have the same level of awareness and understanding as i hope they will be having in relation to the well-being act thank you Chairman, if I may, through you, um, not in this case, Peter, no. Um, th this is the action plan on the what was identified within the governance statement for 1920. So, so we can't retrospectively go back and add things onto it. What we can do, and you're quite right, is for this year, when we go through the senior management assurance statements and produce the annual governance statement, I would expect that, that if we're not meeting those requirements or there is a need for a wider um, awareness, that should then feature in this year's and then be recorded at the end of this year as part of that action plan. So, so it wouldn't be in this one, but it's um, by all means, we, we should be able to feed that into the next one if it's identified as a significant issue or risk to the council. Uh, we, we already have some mitigation with that, though, in terms of we already have a climate strategy. We already have a, quite a lot of work going. So we just need to identify what's the significant issue or risk that's been identified. And if it is, then we'd need to, an action plan and mitigation that would go into to next year for us to deal with. Well, thank you, Adam, for that. I'm reassured. Um, but just to remind members, of course, that the commitments in the Environment Act, there are statutory requirements placed upon swans as a local authority and um, it's not just a matter for the nature conservation people uh, on the council staff it's a matter right across the board but i'm very reassured by that and thank you thank you chair thank you thank you councillor jones uh councillor mike white yes thank you chair thank you adam um i refer to point 2.12 um regards the workforce clearly um you know they've really gone over and above you know all departments than the local authority and i think you know it's a real credit the way that swansea um is is, is dealing with the issues that that we we're all facing and I, I would certainly like like to put on record my thanks for all the support we've given there but clearly adam um would you agree that clear is the main issues that we've got to make sure that we keep together is is the COVID-19, and now with this is now uh, going to sort of move forward, that vaccinations are now available, but also of Brexit. And I think these are the most two important areas that us as a local authority have really got to make sure that, that, that we actually got the, uh, the, the full grip on. Would you agree to that? Again, through you, Chair, if I may. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, th there are so many. It's not only um, the COVID-19 vaccination, yeah, absolutely they are uh, primary drivers, but there is also small businesses, the economic recovery, uh, the challenges that we have in community. We also have the care homes in terms of the implications that COVID has had on those and family bereavement, mental health and, and the, the challenges that lockdowns and, and people not being able to circulate. Then there's the drivers to um, to the health agenda in terms of how people haven't been able to get normal daycare, uh, day services, operations. So, so there's lots of implications on the back of COVID that isn't COVID itself, it's COVID related, that again, we have a support or a lead in, in terms of delivering. And then Brexit, well, I mean, we, we could talk about that for hours in terms of what's, what does Brexit mean for us? And, and as soon as I know, I'll let you know um, but uh, I'm not sure the government knows or, or anyone. 
So, you know, negotiations are underway, um, depending on whether there's a deal or no deal. Um, to be honest, either way, there will be changes afoot. There will be considerable changes in terms of free passage into other countries, for example. There will be more checks at the borders. You know, all this stuff that I'm sure you're aware of will have an impact on supply chains. We have done masses of work. Uh, behind the scenes. And again, even during COVID, the Brexit steering group has continued to meet and prepare across all the services to be as ready as we can be for something we just don't know what's going to happen. So we've checked supply chains, we've double checked suppliers who supply our suppliers, we've looked at how many um, days of stores that we have for various key essential items. So, so there's, there's a whole programme behind Brexit that we are prepared as we think we can be um, and we continue to do so. So I think you're right that there are two, but the knock on of those two singular events of COVID and of, of Brexit have a myriad of, of others that, that will be just as challenging. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Um, right, I've still got three hands. Uh, we'll take Julie Davis next and then Jeff Jones and then Mike Lewis. Julie. OK, thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to pick up on the, the workforce risk as well, because the risk itself um, states that we'd be relying on uh, staff goodwill. And in the action, it talks about an engaged workforce. But in the update, there is no mention of either of those. And I'm wondering whether you have any work either in train or planned to look at those aspects of workforce. OK, so okay. again, through you, Chair, if I may. Yeah, we, we do engage with the workforce. We, we, we do have an engagement strategy. Uh, we also uh, maintain the leadership hub um, helping staff. We've done training sessions to cope with resilience and uh, stress um, with all our, our managers and, and through our leadership team uh, that has also gone online to, to help with people. We, we continue to, to skill and train and prepare and look after the workforce and we do engage through regular updates um, through uh, the chief executive's blog, through regular communications and through COVID to make sure that we engage fully with the workforce to let them know what's happening, what changes, what we're doing. We also make sure that all the managers have a regular check in with all their workforce. Uh, some of them are on just a social setting, not necessarily work related. Might be for them to do a bit of a quiz or just a, a check in with some staff that we either know are vulnerable or perhaps have underlying medical conditions or are just uh, struggling with this working from home. And again, we've identified who they are through their, their managers and there is a regular check in with them. So uh, we, we do make sure that, that the workforce is still being looked after throughout the, the whole of this period. OK, and uh, well, it's nice to hear that there is a top down and and a bottom up approach. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, the next one is Councillor Jeff Jones, please. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> I was going to mention workforce as well. I'm glad Julie actually brought it up. Um, you know, the, the the first part, lack of workforce capacity, capability and resilience and relying on staff goodwill. Um, my first thought of that really was that, you know, staff are under pressure because of the number of employees we have. I know we've actually downsized and so on. So I know you've mentioned about, you know, well-being and so on, actually speaking to staff. I hope we're actually looking at the the number of people that's actually been employed in certain parts of the uh, of the workforce as well to see that i have we got the number of people that you know we duly need um and i've got a second part as well which goes back to the budget um i can see there's a comment there that uh, one of the big problems we, i think we've got at the present time is the unclarity from welsh government with regards to helping to fund covid um, we've got some quite large numbers there, you know, 100 million in revenue and 20 million in, in capital. I know there's a, a further comment further down with regards to um, if needs be, um, we'll actually take it from reserves. Um, 
how you know serious is this? I know it's been reported to uh, council and so on, but it's an ongoing problem that's you know causing a causing issues, especially with me anyway. And there's also a, a comment there: action to be taken. Annual review of sustainable Swansea underway with revised program to deliver future savings in years three onwards. Is that due to this lack of funding that we're having to revise the savings under sustainable Swansea? Okay, I Chair, I, I may defer part of that to, to Ben um, when it comes to more of the budget, who's uh, far more eloquent at explaining the budget situation than, than I could be. But let me let me answer the, the bits that I can do, and then I'll bring Ben in after that. Um, lack of workforce capacity um, and, and the use of goodwill. One of the things during any emergency, and, and that could be just during a um, a normal resilience or, or a civil contingency issue of fire that we've had before or the floods is that we often rely on on goodwill of, of the staff and and to, to be honest um, you know I've only been in, in Swansea for a, a couple of years but I'm very proud um, to fly the flag for Swansea in terms of how good our workforce is when the chips are down they will stand up and be counted and and their goodwill is boundless in terms of the, they just keep giving and you know, it's very proud uh, to be deputy chief exec of an organisation that that is so willing to stand up and just, you know, we're looking at TTP over Christmas um, and, you know, we're going to be asking our staff to work uh, and contact trace over Christmas. We haven't had anyone turn around and say, no, they, they've all put themselves forward. We have a full complement of staff to work over the Christmas period for TTP. Lots of other authorities haven't. They, they're not able to get the staff during that Christmas period. And that that is the, the pride that I think comes from Swansea, is that we know we're here to help the, the population and we're here to serve, and we do. And, and, you know, that's a proud moment for me when I can say things like that. Um, so in, in terms of the number of staff, yeah, yeah, we have reduced the number of staff, but we have to put that in context to the systems that we operate and how we manage the authority. All authorities are reducing numbers. That that's a way of the world with general funding assessments, how we are funded, and the economic climate that that we're in. But we've also automated more system. We've gone more online and channel shift so that people self service. So so you've got to look at it in the round, not just how many staff have we lost. Could we do with more staff? Always. You know, if you wanted to somehow give me another thousand staff, I'd gladly take them. Um, but we, we have to be realistic in, in the climate that we're in and that we are local authority and, and funded by the public purse. So we, we have to think about that value for money. Um, but the goodwill is around how staff will take on more, how they will deliver other things like these emergencies. So um, hopefully we won't have many of these emergencies, certainly not in my lifetime. Um, but it, it, it's, it, is, it is reliance on goodwill. But then in public sector, it often is. Um, okay, you know, with, with just, to, just to clarify, to budget, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I agree the staff are bending over backwards and so on. So really the reliance on staff goodwill is purely because of the COVID. Well, I I, I think it's a hard one, isn't it? You know, we always ask staff to, to step up and do something more and uh, we give them opportunity and, and I can play it many different ways, really, you know. You, you could argue that um, getting staff to do something different um, is goodwill. I could view it as actually it's giving them an opportunity to learn a new skill. So um, it, it depends on how you want to, to you know, um, to portray it, really. And, and I think there is a goodwill. I think in any workforce, there is a goodwill. You know, we, we ask people to attend committees. We ask people to to do perhaps things that are outside their comfort zone at times or step into different areas or go on to a secondment. That there is a goodwill element to that, um, as well as a, a training opportunity and succession planning. So, uh, you know, we, we need to make sure that, that the leaders of tomorrow, the people that are coming through the, the various tiers of, of leadership into, into management, um, have those opportunities, but they do it not for extra pay, but partly for self fulfillment, perhaps for, for that future role, or because they want to take that that next step. So I think that there's an array of things, but it's not just COVID. That is the way of the world. You okay, asked about the budget. 
um, in terms of where are we in terms of, of, of the, the budget and uh, the robustness. The, the, the elements within there are that, you know, we are at risk with some things in that we have to pay them out before we get the money back from Welsh Government. And although we have often nice words from Welsh Government that they will fund and, and they will cover, the, the devil's always in the detail. And although we get cover of statements like, um, yes, we will we'll cover that expense, until you put the actual um, invoice into Welsh Government, we don't always get it out. And you know, Ben and his, his finance team have led the way, I think it's fair to say, across uh, Wales in terms of making sure grants get out to businesses early, that those people that, that are in need of financial support are given it quickly. Um, and in doing that, we do take a risk in that um, if at any point Welsh Government decided not to give us that funding, we would be left um, with, with a hole in our financial budgets. But is it the right thing to do? Absolutely. The finance team have, again, through their own goodwill, bent backwards to make sure that all the monies, the grants and, and the uh, payments that needed to go out have gone out promptly so that people are not disadvantaged in, in the community. But that does leave us at, at a risk. But hopefully, fingers crossed, um, we should recover all that money. But if not, then there, there could be an issue. I don't, I don't know if Ben... If, if you have anything you want to add to that. Uh, I'll probably add a few words, but I'll try to be relatively brief, Chair, given uh, yeah. the, 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 the time. I be brief because I've still got to uh, wait to ask a question and I need to wrap this up soon. Well, on so that put... Yeah, on that basis, then I'll remind Audit Committee what I've said to scrutiny Cabinet and Council, which is we are in unprecedented times. As Adam has indicated, I'm spending money before I've even got assurance I'm getting it back. That does inherently raise a number of risks, but a number of risks that I've been comfortable with taking. And my overall advice to you is it's as good as it gets in the current year that on the back of the very large outturn underspends last year, the amounts that are being committed are no more than we outturned as underspent last year. Councillor Jeff Jones is quite right because he does have a, a, a concern particularly about the future borrowing commitments and the obligations through to 25-26. That is one of the reasons why I volunteered that as part of the budget setting process, we would try to pilot that in particular because I am adamant that whilst the, the legal duty is to immediately balance the current year and then the following year, in theory, it should be all future years. And so I have always got one eye on the, the longer medium term. And of course, whatever happens in the current year, uh, we wait and see what happens, given that we've only just had the spending review. And we're not going to know our settlement until the 22nd of December. It should come as no surprise that things are fraught. They are managed fraught um, and you see some other authorities in graver difficulty shall we say particularly across the border and whilst I'm not entirely happy in one sense with the way the Welsh Government has chosen to administer the pots of money I would rather have unconditional grant offers up front before I've spent the money to protect local taxpayers uh, I am still thankful at the overall quantum of sums that are available in Wales compared to um, authorities in England and so I've got to lump it to some extent uh, along with other authorities, but it's as good as it gets. Um, and um, you're OK for this year. I expect you to be OK for next year. Um, I will continue to give on the record advice if I'm in, unhappy at any future year. That's probably a, a, a succinct an approach as I can give chair to, to assure members. You, ben. Can I can we leave it at that and I'll move on to Councillor Mike Lewis, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, picking up from Julie and Jeff's point about their concerns about the workforce, uh, Adam, can you tell us the percentage of local authority staff absent at present? And as the pandemic continues to get worse, do you envisage this percentage will increase? And how will it impact on future performance reviews? And do you feel this should be part of the contribution to our action plan for next year? Thank you. Adam? Thanks, Mike. Can you ask me an easier one? <laughs> um, right. So in terms of the workforce, how many are absent? I, I don't have those, those figures to hand, um, but, but I can certainly get them to you. What I can tell you is that the last time I looked at them, there is a lower absenteeism now than there was previously. And part of that 
is down to the agile that we were already looking to bring in as part of supporting the workforce and different ways of working. So for the last few years, we've slowly been moving the workforce onto an agile workforce. This means that people can adjust their time of working to best fit in also with family life, as well as making sure that the council and the needs for the council are met. So this means that if, if somebody wakes up in the morning and perhaps doesn't feel very well or, or there is a slight issue with them, um, actually they, they might take a few hours off in the morning by lunchtime, actually they're okay again and they'll just work into the afternoon and the evening rather than that, that morning, which, which means that they're better looked after as, as a workforce and at the same time we're still getting um, the, the date from them uh, that we had previously. The plan that we've seen uh, in terms of moving everyone to, to home working has seen a real good benefit in terms of, of the reduction in absenteeism, um, partly flexibility, partly because there aren't the pressures of, of getting to and from work and people can ebb and flow in terms of, of their work time. So as part of uh, the recovery plan, which um, I believe the, the majority of you you have seen, and uh, Julie, you you may not have seen the recovery plan as, as yet being being new, but uh, happy to send send you a copy of that. That that breaks down into three areas: the response to COVID, where we then go in terms of the next eighteen months, and then after that, what we do after the next election. That middle period of the eighteen months has a workforce element to it, which will pick up. Um, both the absenteeism, performance management, appraisals and all that side of it to make sure that, that we do have a robust workforce plan that supports um, the objectives of the council um, and the plans that we already have in place, which is the corporate plan and the aims to make sure that we meet them. So um, absenteeism is down in terms of sickness and we're seeing less sickness on the back of it save obviously long-term sickness we, we can't do much about uh, so that's the the sort of more serious cancers and and things which obviously uh, we still manage through occupational health and support the workforce through that uh, hopefully um, uh, health crisis until they hopefully can return back to work okay can I thank you Adam Mike I, perhaps we'll ask Adam for you to have those figures and maybe they can be shared with the committee members as well. I've got one final question from hopefully from Councillor Walton. Yeah, actually it's more just to add a bit of information because we've talked about the well-being of staff, which is obviously absolutely crucial over the last few months. You um, and partly to uh, for Julie's information, there is an in-house um, service called Helping Hands whereby which gives um, free support to all staff and interestingly also to councillors because I'm sure there are some over the last few months who have been really stretched to the limit serving their communities so it, it's been a very uh, successful um, service being offered and I know they've been particularly promoting themselves again recently at, as the figures of have got worse, which I'm sure puts an additional mental burden on staff and also councillors alike. Thank you. Thank you. If we could bring this paper to a close then. The paper was for information and I think we've had a really good discussion and, and questions around the content of that paper. I think workforce is a key issue and a, a concern of mine also, so I wouldn't repeat um, the comments made by members of the committee. Um, but I'd be keen to keep a, a watch on that recovery plan because we keep getting assurance that the recovery plan would address all our concerns around the workforce agenda. So I'm interested to see how effective that's, that will be once it comes into play. And I know Councillor Black has got that featured on the scrutiny uh, committee's agenda as well. And I'll be linking in with Councillor Black to make sure that we see some progress on that. So if we can take this for information and move on to the next agenda. I'm minded that Councillor Peter Jones will need to leave. Um, I don't know whether you want to send us any questions you've got, uh, Councillor Jones, before you have to leave or if you want to hang on. Can I ask Councillor Peter Jones? Yeah, mute is on, Councillor Jones. 
Are you okay with the, are you okay with the time, Councillor Jones? Right, I hope it'll stay on. Uh, I'm here, I can stay until half past three. Oh, so that's I'm fine then. Here for the next item. Thank you, Chair. Okay then, that's fine, thank you. If we can move on then to the election of the Audit Committee representative on the Governance Group. Can I ask for Jeremy's advice on which way you want to handle this one? Just ask for nomination. Okay, can we have nominations, please? Nominations for representation on the Governance Group, which yeah, is the work no, that I'll, Les... I'll nominate... Les, Les, Councillor Leslie Walton. Well, I'll second. Nominate, I'll second that, sir. Yeah, and I'll nominate Peter Black. Hello, anybody there? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so we've got a nomination for Councillor Peter Black yeah. and a nomination for Councillor yeah. Leslie Walton. Yeah, Any can I, other? Can I remind, you know, a year ago we actually said that this would rotate every year, not for Indeed. one person to actually carry on. Indeed, I think that we was did. minuted and it all agreed by the audit committee. Indeed, we did. Yes. So do we need a rotational membership in that? instance can we do should we have a vote on do we need to rotate the post again then yeah i think yeah so. i think so. do you want that individually um can we yeah, have hands up like. if we <coughs> think we need to rotate how, how, the post? how can we have a vote on something we agreed a year ago i, I i'm sorry i I'm, don't I'm understand this for, i'm looking for advice from well, jeremy in in the actual minute it was just appointing Councillor Walton, and I think it's to be reviewed in a in a year. I'm not certain it was. No, I, I think you're wrong there, Jeremy. I think it would be agreed to rotate every year. I'd have to clarify on the minutes with that, unless you defer it to the next meeting. Shall we defer it then in that case and so. until the next meeting in January? And then we, if, if that is the case, then we will be looking for uh, a, a new representative. <coughs> Um, Councillor uh, Sam Pritchard, I can see a hand up. Oh, thank you, Chair. I, I was just going to say that uh, regardless of what, what the minutes say, I think given the unprecedented circumstances, I think uh, the committee now should be in a position to make its own decision and not be bound by uh, you know, a, a previous agreement, whether formal or informal. Um, and given that the complexities of the issues of COVID uh, I, I personally think Leslie has done an excellent job throughout and, and should continue. Um, but if if councillors are happy to defer, I'm I'm happy to defer. Should we defer that? Councillor Jeff I, Jones. Yeah, I, I think we should because, you know what I mean, we'll all have a vote or something and then six months time we'll actually say, well, forget about that vote. Let's, uh, let's do what we want. I, I'm happy to take a steer, so we defer and then we'll get clarification of what the minutes yeah. say and then we can have that um, selection process um, in January. Thank you for that. Um, but I agree, Councillor Leslie Walton has done a, an amazing job in, in representing the Audit Committee over the last 12 months and thank you for that. Um, okay. Um, if we can move on to an update on a review of partnership. Adam, if I can ask you to position this statement, because I'm, I'm conscious there will be a considerable number of hands going up. Um, so if you can put, position it with the key, key things you need to draw to our attention, please. I will, thank you, Chair. Um, so the, the first thing really then is just to, to say on page 27, that this was a uh, joint initiative from the Welsh Government and the WLGA, Welsh Local Government Association, uh, agreed in April 2019 to undertake a review of strategic partnerships. The final document with recommendations was completed in June 2020, just five months ago, in the middle of the early response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, the action plan that, that comes from this between pages 28 through to 33 offers the, which I won't go into, but offers the background methodology of the partnerships, the barriers, government governance and accountability is all set out there uh, in terms of what was taken account of in producing that report. 
if I move then swiftly onto page 34, we get on to the recommendations. Um, this review concluded with 11 recommendations, which are set out on pages 34 and 35. And there is a further um, Appendix A, 37 to page 43, which set out the detail of those recommendations and the actions taken and future actions, bearing in mind that this is still a relatively uh, uh, in June and, and in light of what's already been mentioned in terms of the pandemic and the time that we've had to be able to, to deal with this. It's more future looking in terms of what else can we do? Um, but the report does set out clearly the current position and the action plan for the future. And again, I, I think um, within page 37, it talks about the uh, CJC's um, uh, joint committees, sorry, corporate joint committees. Uh, we always fall into the acronym. Sorry about that. Uh, the, so the corporate joint committee that went to uh, council on the 3rd of December for agreement, which was agreed uh, with a, a couple of amendments. I've sent a copy of that uh, now um, to Paula, the chair, uh, and happy to circulate that more widely to, to the whole of the committee after the meeting so that you can see the response that's gone back in relation to that um, item number number one. Again, um, you will see through uh, page 7 to 43 that the action has been taken on a number of areas. Uh, and again, I, I can only pay tribute to the staff involved in these because it's a council wide uh, report really in terms of the strategic partnerships that we have. Still lots of work to do. Uh, but again, the staff have, during a most difficult time, still been able to do work on, on achieving some of these or working towards them. Uh, I'll leave it at that then, Chair, as setting the scene. OK, then. Thank you so much. Um, Councillor Peter Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, an, excuse me, an observation, if I may. Obviously, partnerships are a necessary part of... Uh, into council and into authority working and I think we all recognise and accept that. Um, my observation is I'm slightly surprised and I'm sorry to sound like a gramophone record but I, I'm surprised that we don't have any kind of partnership looking at cross council environmental responsibilities. You know um, biodiversity doesn't respect local authority boundaries any more than Covid does and I find it slightly surprising that we don't have a partnership board uh, in that sort of area, but I'm not expecting necessarily uh, a, a, an answer on that. Um, my question more relates to the, the, the report refers to some concerns about what is variously called citizen engagement and democratic accountability. And I think we all recognise, of course, that partnership boards, whatever their responsibilities, are a further step away from local elected members. And, uh, and therefore a further step away from, if you like, democratic accountability. And I think there is a concern quite in terms of these bodies as to quite what they do and how they are accountable for what they do uh, in terms of their actions. And the further away they get from elected bodies, the more remote they become in terms of accountability. Um, so there's that concern. And also this reference to citizen engagement well, that's an interesting one, of course, because um, how do you uh, how do you create the means of citizen engagement? Um, you can elect somebody uh, to sit on a body. That person may or may not, however hard they try, be able to report back, and if so, report back to whom as to quite what the uh, fulfilment of their citizen responsibility might have been. But citizen engagement is extremely difficult and gets into a whole new area of um, political accountability, uh, moving away perhaps from representative bodies into more sort of citizen bodies, if you like. So that's a difficult one. So but to come back to my basic point then, uh, partnership bodies are more remote from the electorate than say we are as councillors here in Swansea, um, and concern therefore about their decisions. I mean, I was just to fulfil. I mean, I, I was involved in the development of the Wellbeing Act in a previous life, um, and I remember being puzzled by the inclusion in the legislation 
of the provision for public services boards, uh, which didn't seem somehow to me to quite fit with the objectives of the Wellbeing Act. And indeed, some members of a member of the uh, Senate actually voted against the legislation for that reason when it was there debate and I remain slightly unclear as to the extent to which the Public Services Board for this area is adding value to what we as an authority could otherwise do quite independently uh, for itself but that's just a personal view uh, but I would welcome comments please in particular on the whole issue of accountability thank you chair thank you councillor Jones Adam yeah um I'll come back on a couple of bits on there. Um, certainly in terms of environment, um, one of the things that the PSB now has a focus on is a city for wellbeing and environment. They are adding considerable value in terms of they've received a £25,000 grant from uh, Natural Resources Wales in order to commit um, studies and additional work uh, across Swansea on the back of the PSB being able to lobby and bring that money in. So, so I think the PSB does have a role. I think until now it hasn't been defined properly or as well as it could have been in order to make maximum use of, of the resources and bringing people together. Um, we also have the climate change agenda that you're aware of and we do have working groups within the council that are working on on the environment and the wider climate change. In terms of citizen engagement, I think part of that is also about being transparent. So it's about making sure that meetings are open to um, the public and making sure that they can ask questions. And one of the things over the last year we've done with the PSB, for example, is we've opened those up, those meetings now, to the public who can attend any of the PSB meetings and ask questions on anything that's on the agenda. Not every authority has done that or authority area with regard to PSB. And I think we'll see more of that happen as we come through that makes us more accountable, um, but also has that citizen engagement at its most um, fundamental level, which is on the ground where decisions are made and actually things are happening. So I think we will see more of that. And we also need to look more, um, and I'm doing a training session tomorrow on consultation with uh, some of the departments on how we can use consultation better, more informed and more accurately in order to get citizen engagement. And who knows, perhaps one day we may end up with a the equivalent of a youth parliament or a youth council, uh, which would be great uh, to see also coming into the to the authority. So that again, we think about not only citizen engagement at, at the age group, but also the young, you know, we, we think about the um, the New Wales bill that, that will open up voting for 16, 17 year olds. Again, how do we engage and make sure that they are aware of what it is that we're doing and, and how we can engage with them properly to make sure that their vote counts for the future in terms of the, their, their viewpoint? And we've seen that through the climate agenda, how the younger generation have grabbed this with both hands and actually forced change. And we need to capitalise on that because they have a voice and we need to listen to it. Uh, have that answered the question, Chair. Through you, Thank Ted, you. Very quickly. Thank you, Adam, for that, that, that response. I mean, as it happens, I sit on the Working with Nature working group, which contributes, of course, into uh, the PSB uh, through NRW uh, and so forth. Um, but I sometimes have the feeling on that group that we're not actually adding anything that we couldn't do perfectly well for ourselves as a council without the input um, of that or that group, but be that as it may. But I think there is, I, I'm not saying there isn't a role for the PSB. I think there is. Uh, but it's not, it's worth remembering, of course, that when PSBs were set up under the Wellbeing Act, the intention was to bring uh, neighbouring collaborating authorities together uh, in that regard. But uh, as I see it at the moment, they seem to be single authority bodies. And I wonder whether that's a very productive exercise. Sorry, Chair, if, if I can just come back on that, they're not single bodies. We, we already have, uh, again, through TTP, what we've done on the COVID response uh, has been facilitated through joint working across a number of areas of which the PSB has helped facilitate that. We also work on substance misuse collaboratively across um, the Western Bay footprint. Uh, so we work with Neathport Talbot. We also work on... Um, the um, domestic abuse agenda, again, corporately across 
um, both Neathport, Talbot and ourselves. If we look at also the footprints of education that we work on. So we are working lots. Um, I think one of the things that we've not been good at because we've been, we had 130 something different actions that the PSB needed to work on, which was too many. And now what we're doing is we're focusing on four distinct areas that mean we can truly collaborate because the, before that it was just too big. So I think you watch over the next year about how more of that And the first bit of that is with the Natural Resources Wales, £25,000 working across areas that's coming on the back of the PSB. OK, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Mike White. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, the main thing really with partnerships, Adam, uh, if you, would you agree that clearly that everybody got to be committed, all stakeholders involved, and they need the, the drive and the ambition to make that partnership work. And I think that is the nut that we've got to crack really first. Um, and as I say, uh, that, 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 that is my concern that, you know, if we've got stakeholders involved with us as a authority working in partnership, that everybody has, a, has an, an equal input on it. But I think that, that, that uh, as I said earlier, the, the, to, to, to get that function really from the off, that everybody got to be fully, fully committed, which is clearly set out within the recommendations and uh, in, in section eight of the, of the document. Thank you, Councillor White. Adam, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, just, I, I can't really argue against that. Absolutely, partnerships is about though having a common aim. We, we need to define what it is that we're working towards that has that merit for everyone. And if, if we define what, what the outcome is and how it will benefit each, then it's much easier to get that commitment and get that buy-in if we're clear on what the resources are needed. So I think part of it is that scoping from the outset and being very clear. And, you know, if I go back to the PSB, I think that's where we were previously. We, we were a, a bit of a scattergun. We, we hadn't quite defined exactly what it is that we needed to do. And, and I could speak about a number of bodies. As soon as you have that one focus, and it polarizes everybody in order to make that that difference and that commitment and that buy-in and we've really seen that through what we have done with um with the covid response in terms of working with the health board with albert and and with welsh government that partnership has grown into a real uh, really strong partnership that will have benefits already in terms of what we're doing with adult social care, what we're doing with, with the wider partnerships and, and responses that we can give to support communities. Thank you, Adam. OK, if we can move now to the final uh, question. Sure, I have my hand up as well. Councillor Peter Black. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to, a few comments really. I mean, first, I don't understand why we, why we haven't already got a youth council when quite a few local authorities do have one. And I do totally agree with what Peter Jones is saying about partnership about partnerships and their accountability gap, which, which is built into them. But the other thing I don't understand is why the Welsh Government is saying we don't want any more partnerships and they're now creating statutory joint committees, which are effectively more partnerships um, and which are again going to... Um, increase that accountability gap. I think the problem with accountability is, it, 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 with the partnerships is, is in terms of accountability, is they're one step removed from directly elected members. And, and that is where the accountability gap is. I mean, actually, I wasn't aware until Adam just said it, that I was able to go along to Public Services Board and ask questions. Um, and I've just had a look now and I've just found the agendas on, on mod.gov, which means I now know about that. But that's you know, in, in the lines, in, if you like, the lack of information out there about how these partnerships are working and the lack of information about how people can participate in them and, and, and hold them to account. Um, but the final thing I want to say is that on Tuesday, we do have an opportunity to directly question the Public Services Board um, in the Scrutiny Committee, Scrutiny Programme Committee. So I'm sure Peter will be coming along to ask lots of questions about the environment at that meeting. Thank you, Peter, Councillor Black. Councillor Paxton Hood Williams. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I just have to say as well, like Councillor Black, I find it uh, very ironic that the first recommendation says no new partnership should be established. 
and the progress to date is that Welsh Government are currently consulting on proposals for CDCs. I cannot bring those two together. I do not understand. If anybody can explain that to me, I really would be grateful. Having said that, and I said it the other day, so members will know I've said this before on a number of occasions, this, in essence, I think is a thin end to the wedge in terms of getting rid of local authorities as we understand them in Wales at the moment. I think it's the start of that process. And Peter Blackman know full well, the same as I do, the proposals that were on the <coughs> that were in place before the last uh, assembly elections in terms of mergers of councils. The Welsh Government for a long time has had the ambition to reduce that. So this is only an interim situation. Where are we going to go and how long is it going to take, Adam, before we get to the final stage where effectively we've been run initially anyway by CJCs before they eventually disappear and everything comes back to Welsh Government? What's your, what's, what's your prognosis on that, Adam? It'd be interesting. Have we got a crystal ball? And you can tell me what that is, but I think that's where we're going. Adam, can we have final comments from you then, please? Yeah, unfortunately, my crystal ball is really cloudy. But the one thing I would say after, after being in and around local government for nearly 30 years, everything is circular. So uh, what comes in tends to go out and comes back to where it was before. So uh, watch this space. I mean, CJCs, yeah, why create more partnerships when we've already got some that, that would do that? But hey, I, I'm, I'm just an officer. I, I don't do politics, as you know. Um, and, and just in terms of, of uh, Peter's uh, previous comments in terms of uh, the PSB and, and didn't realise, we do have a number of, of public questions and, and public that do turn up to, to the meeting. So um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to scrutiny next week when uh, I'll be on the uh, podium again of <laughs> being challenged. So thank you all. Thank you, Adam. Councillor Paxton Hood Williams. I will come back again for a minute if I may, Madam Chairman. Just so um, <coughs> members can be aware, obviously it's bound to happen that in terms of CJCs, they're going to cost money to fund. Now that money is going to be top sliced from the RSG effectively. So that means that less money is going to come to councils in that respect. You're going to have to be looking at your budgets to see what can happen. And we've seen that all the way through. We've seen it with Aero taking a, slot, a, a slice out of the uh, education budgets which means there's less money going to schools. And we see it all the time. It's all it is, is an increase in bureaucracy, which is going to cost us money, for which we're not going to have anything to show for it. So the sooner we can get back to getting value for money in terms of what we're paying for governments, government, government, government in this country, the sooner the better. End of, end, end, of the, end of the statement, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. <coughs> Adam, you got your hand, Silla? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. It was just, just uh, in relation to, to Paxton's uh, final uh, comment. Um, I will circulate the CJC response that came from Council. Um, the, the point that Paxton makes is in there uh, quite strongly in terms of, you know, th this is an extra burden potentially. We are looking for Welsh Government to fund that. Um, however, whatever comes in doesn't come out the other end for something else. So there's only one pot of money. So um, not, not disagreeing with what Paxton says at all. Um, you know, it's got to be paid for from somewhere. But we have put that back as a, in the consultation document saying that this shouldn't be a burden on local authorities. This should be funded from some other part, not in relation to local authorities. Thank you, everyone, for, the, for your contributions on this paper. The reason the committee asked for this paper to come um, to this meeting is just to get an update on the progress that was being made against the recommendations and, and basically the complexity of the partnering arrangements and the governance all around it is quite frankly a, a, you know, a complex area. It's like a spider's web where the, where the threads go, who knows? Uh, and I'm sure it'll be on the agenda and as complex in 12 months time as it currently is now and will continue to puzzle each and every one of us. But if you can keep us informed, Adam, of any critical areas of risk around these partnering arrangements, that would be helpful. Um, we've got two items on the agenda before the end of the meeting. One is the tracker and the other is the work plan. If we could take them together for uh, speed of efficiency, just to update the committee with the tracker, um, with regards to the first item around risk, um, just to advise you that I'm meeting with Sarah 
Lackenby yeah. on Monday. Um, she's emailed me to confirm progress is being made with the risk management software and members should uh, be able to access the risk management system by the Christmas week. And I'm meeting with her on Monday purely to discuss what we will need as an audit committee by way of reporting because they develop in a suite of reports and I wanted to see what they were looking like because I think the, the committee needs to have lean, informative, succinct report, not reams and reams of information that should be dealt with by the senior management team and the middle tier within the council. Um, so just to give you an update and also to advise the committee, I met with the chief exec on the 1st of December and all the concerns that have been raised by the committee over the preceding 10 or 12 months, I've shared with the chief exec and he's assured me he will pick all of those concerns up through the work of the CMT. And one of those areas are around the workforce challenges and resource, particularly around the governance agenda where that resource is quite thin. Um, so I'd have no more to say on that unless there are any comments on the agenda item eight or nine. They're both for information other than what updates I've just given you. Are there any questions? Any comments? No? OK, if you allow me then to close the meeting, I don't want to close without wishing you all a very happy Christmas. I'm sorry I can't share sweets this year like I normally do, but hopefully in, in, as soon as we're allowed to meet again as a committee, I shall make a cup for that with some homemade cakes or something. So again, please stay safe. Please enjoy your Christmas and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Madam Chairman. I'm sure you would reciprocate that as well. Yes, thank all you. of us. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Thank you, Chair. Merry thank Christmas, you. you all.